in the sky, gazing far into the night. I raise my hand to the fire, but it's no use, cause you can't stop it from shining through. It's true, baby, let the light shine through. If you believe it's true, baby, won't you let the light Detection Radio. I'm Kay. And I'm Chad. We pray you all had a blessed week. We're really excited to welcome back Derek Gilbert and Gary Wayne to Deception Detection Radio. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, so to glad to be you. back. We're it's glad been to have a while, you. Gary. <laughs> it's been a while, yeah. I've been looking forward to coming back and working with you and Chad again, and uh, yeah. especially with Derek at the same time. I can't think of a a better way to come back and do another show and guest with you today. So excited about it. Oh, we've been excited about it too, getting you both together. This is going to be an amazing evening. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, start out with the opening prayer. Uh, Derek, did you want to go ahead and start us out sure. on that, please? Sure, I'll jump in. Thank you. Uh, Father, we thank you for drawing us together and uh, for making this uh, technology possible that we can... Um, connect over the uh, the many miles that separate us, but uh, bringing us together over your word, which unites us and uh, guides us, instructs us, and encourages us. Father, we pray as we speak that you'll grant us clarity of thought and word, grant us wisdom and discernment as we seek to understand better the nature of the uh, the war in, in, which we, uh, in, in which we live. Father, we know that you've already won the victory. The enemy is simply trying to cause as much damage as possible. And we pray, Father, that uh, those who hear this may begin to understand the, the nature of this conflict and the, the gravity of the situation, that um, those who've not yet made a decision to accept Jesus Christ would be moved to do so because of the fact that uh, we are literally in a war for our eternal souls and those of our family members, our friends, our colleagues. Father, we pray that, uh, again, you'll grant us clarity of thought and word as we speak. Help us as we speak, not to add anything to your word or take anything away from it, but to speak only that which you would have us speak. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Derek. My honor. Well, I guess I'm going to be kicking this off, so I will go ahead and... um, I know that uh, we had talked a little bit about the uh, Apkalu, and we've talked about the Anunnaki, um, the 70 gods of Psalms 82. Um, I, I know that some Christians are familiar with the uh, Book of Enoch and the 200 fallen angels, but uh, one of the things that I've run across here lately on the research from the film that I've been working on with Justin, the uh, Hollow Earth Chronicles, um, was when we interviewed uh, Chief Joseph Riverwind, and he got into about the ant people and started talking about that their actual name was the Anu Naki. Um, I'm sure you guys hmm. are probably familiar with that. Yeah, I'm familiar with that. That's uh, one of those coincidences that you just, uh, you know, it's very, very, very hard to ignore. And then when you also look at the shape of the ant head, Right, it is that sort of elongated look with that high cheekbone and those uh, extended jaw bones, and it's very, very similar to descriptions of Anunnaki and Nephilim. Exactly, and um, basically, I, I mean, I think you guys are pretty much, you know, in agreement that uh, these are, these things are all pretty much talking about the same type of creatures and beings, or entities, whatever you want to call them. Well, sure, the enemy is going to reveal itself in uh, different ways to different people across the uh, the ages, but uh, the end result of the deception is always the same. Whether they present themselves as gods or extraterrestrials, the, the goal, the message is the same, which is that uh, they're 
you know, that they are gods and that what we as Christians believe is uh, in error. And it's always an anti-Christian message. It's, uh, you, you don't often hear reports from, uh, we'll say, uh, extra UFO experiencers, contactees or abductees that uh, criticizes the beliefs of you know, Hindus, Buddhists, or, or Muslims. It's, it's always the God of the Bible. It's amazing how consistent the messages always are, as well as the descriptions of these types of entities and from, you know, all cultures, uh, all ages, uh, particularly into prehistory, that they're all describing the same type of uh, fallen angel or god or alien type of being, being that all have the same religion, that all have the same sort of outlook. Uh, just as Derek was saying, is always anti-Christian and always pro-Eastern mysticism or polytheism. Um, but even the descriptions of the gods and the description of what they do for humankind, it's, it's an amazingly identical story that is told all over the world, but always from a polytheist perspective. Hmm. Yeah, one of the things that... Uh Riverwind actually got into detail and was talking about was their uh, ancestors said that their um, their people came from the stars. They said that they came from the um, Pleiades or the Seven Sisters and said that they actually came down here uh, and that's basically how the giants were created here in the Americas. Well, again, and, and the Pleiades is one of those common denominators in, in prehistory and with the flood story. Just as the Pleiades will show up in some verses uh, in, in the Bible, as in, um, you know, I think it's in Job and uh, Amos and in, in the Psalms. Um, but what's interesting about the Pleiades as well is it's also connected as the Seven Sisters and connected to Orion, which is also connected to the flood, and in whether, and particularly in Native American uh, mythologies, like from the Hopi and others, uh, and from the Kishamaya uh, and from Atlantean uh, mythologies, because they're all kind of connected back as you trace their religions and their history back to the white snake clam that comes out of the island in in the Atlantic, is that they have this recollection of two or three, depending on. The, the legend or the religion stars out of the Pleiades that hits the oceans that starts the conflagration of catastrophes that leads to the flood event. And then when they have versions of the Babel story in polytheism after the flood, they build this temple at the bottom of the Babel tower that's dedicated to uh, Enki uh, and whatever other vernacular name of the gods it might be in the other religions. And it's dedicated to both Enki and these two stars or asteroids or meteors, whatever they were, that begat the flood. So, again, you have this connection that is inexplicable, all coming mostly from a polytheist account that is rarely sort of tried to be analyzed in terms of, okay, does the Bible say anything on that? And is there a correlation there that they're telling obviously the same story, but through a different lens? Sorry about that. Couldn't find my button there for a second. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, and uh, like I said, it's, it's very interesting how, I mean, this, this stuff is so interwoven and, and connected. Uh, Derek, do, do you mind jumping in and talking a little bit about uh, your book, The Great Inception, where you talked about the mountains and these portals and the gods? Well, Babel was uh, the, the artificial mountain, but mountains in general were play a key role in the narrative of the Bible. I mean, Mountains are, have been sacred all over the world for as long as uh, humans have been walking this planet. And skeptics, secularists would say, well, it's just because you know, primitive man was uh, t too, too simple to recognize that uh, that wasn't where the gods lived. So, you know, our, our distant ancestors assumed that's where the gods lived because it was the, the mountaintops are remote. They're pristine, unsullied by 
the uh, mundane toil of human hands. And so because of the best places, that's obviously where the gods must live. But uh, I, I think it recalls a time when mankind actually did live on the mountain of God. The first mountain, uh, holy mountain, or cosmic mountain, if you will, was uh, Eden. Ezekiel 28 tells us that, uh, yes, it was a garden, but it was a garden on God's holy mountain. And it was from that mountain that the rebel in Eden, uh, also mentioned in Isaiah 14, was cast out. Uh, Isaiah 14 gets more specific there. Uh, and, and what happens next, the shades rose up to meet him, the shades being the Rapha, the Rephaim. Um, it was a, 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 I think, an attempt by the, the enemy, the fallen, who rebelled against God, the creator, to create another mountain that would replace God's holy mountain, uh, would reign supreme in the cosmos. Um, Isaiah 14 is pretty specific about that and identifies, it in fact identifies the mountain uh, where it talks about the sides of the north, which is a phrase in Hebrew, um, and my pronunciation will butcher the words, but uh, I'll give it a shot anyway. The Yaraka Tzephon, uh, that only appears in scripture three times. Uh, another one of those times is Ezekiel 38, where it's talking about the, the hordes of Gog and Magog coming from the uttermost heights of the north. Um, Mount Zephon which uh, was so important to the, uh, in the culture of Israel because of the influence of the god Baal or Baal. You actually, uh, the, the word Zephon actually became the uh, Hebrew word for the compass point north. But everyone in the ancient world knew that that was the holy mountain of Baal where his uh, palace was located. So um, that's, where I, that's what Isaiah 14 identifies as the, uh, the, the goal of this divine rebel who was kicked out of Eden to establish Mount Zephon as the cosmic mountain, which I think argues for the identity of the, uh, the entity in uh, Eden to be the entity then that later represented itself to the ancient world as the storm god, whether you called him Baal, Baal, uh, or by one of the other names uh, it was known by. Uh, to the Greeks, it was Zeus. To the Romans, it was Jupiter. Uh, to the Hurrians, it was um, uh, Teshub. To the Hittites, it was Tarhun. You know, there, a number of names, but the same entity, apparently, uh, all pointing to that uh, entity and to that uh, place, that uh, mountain on the border between Turkey and Syria today, uh, today called Jabal al-Akra, as the uh, the, the place where this entity wanted to establish his throne and dominion over the earth to replace that of Yahweh. Um, Babel was the artificial mountain that uh, Nimrod wanted to use to uh, create a, a locality for the, the abode of the gods. And this is according to uh, a poem, a Sumerian poem that is, uh, that was rediscovered in the 19th century translated um, it uh, mentions the Sumerian king Enmerkar, who, like Nimrod, was the second generation after the flood. The poem also mentions the confusion of language. And there's some scholars who disagree about that. It, uh, uh, some interpret that poem as saying the confused languages were all made one tongue. But the odds of that particular episode, whether it's confusing the languages or unifying the languages, taking uh, one and, and many languages and attaching it to the... Uh, project to construct a, a temple or to rebuild the temple of Enki, the uh, god of the abyss, uh, to create the abode of the gods is beyond coincidental. So uh, what you had at Babel was an attempt to create, if you want to use the word portal, uh, I guess it's, it's accurate. Uh, it was an opportunity, it was an, it was a, uh, an attempt by mankind to force its way back into um, the divine council, the divine assembly, um, by creating an artificial mount of assembly or mount of the congregation. That's what Babel was all about, and uh, that's why God was compelled to personally intervene and put a stop to it. Um, but that's what the whole of this rebellion is about between these small G gods and the God, their creator, capital G God. It's about who is going to rule the Mount of Assembly, the mountain where the gods, small g gods, gather 
to serve the, uh, the ruler, who of course is the creator of the universe, Yahweh, the God of the Bible. Um, these small g gods want to overthrow their creator and rule in his place on their own Mount of Assembly. Um, God has identified Zion as his holy mountain forever. That is the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, and that is where the, 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 the final battle between good and evil, Armageddon, will be fought. Um, and uh, that's why the subtitle of my book is called uh, Satan's Psyops from Eden to Armageddon. It began on a mountain, it's going to end on a mountain, and the whole of history is about this struggle between God the Creator and these small g-gods who rebelled against his authority. Yeah, and I'm going to underline and connect a few things in here from what Derek was just talking about, this idea of a holy mountain and whether or not it was one civilization before the flood or as a as other religions and occult uh, legends will talk about as many as four to seven to nine, typically seven tends to be more of the common denominator. They have that commonality of that holy mountain they're known by different names around the world you know the chinese have the have actually named the seven mountains um, as part of their mythology and so you have a mountain let's say that's in greek mythology that's olympus and of course most people are familiar with herman which uh, most uh well, not most, but a lot of people connect in uh, some of the beliefs coming out of Mesopotamia. That is Mount Nippur, which was the Sumerian mountain, the holy congregation. You have Adiops, which was the Mount of Serpents, which was connected to Atlantis. And uh, wherever you go around the world, you have that ideology of this assembly of this holy mountain. And again, that, I don't think that that's a coincidence, and I don't think it's a coincidence that Humans were trying to build pyramids, whether it's Babel uh, in a tower, no, no, on all the while noting that towers, ziggurats, and pyramids were thought of as the same type of structure in the Andalusian epoch and in the early post-Diluvian epoch, that they were trying to create these holy mountains because this is where the gods came to meet. And they came from the other dimensions, whether through portals or however uh, the gods move back and forth between uh, the, uh, the different dimensions, the spirit world and the physical world. But this is, was a, a place where they met and met the kings of uh, the antediluvian epoch or the ring lords, as it would be known in some hmm. more modern traditions. And so these were the Anunnaki. That comes out of the Anunnaki sort of version of it. Uh, and so anything that's circular, like a King Arthur's table or a ring lord, uh, or a ring is always from that sort of tradition. And I think it's interesting that they're always trying to copycat or make a false replication of what God has set up. Even though they're fighting for a rebellion and probably being different and away from God and not following his rules, they're always trying to recreate this this copycat version, a.k.a. Antichrist, will come back as a copycat of, uh, or will come to us as a copycat of uh, Jesus, just as the false prophet is another copycat, just as the thousand-year reign is another copycat. So it's, it's very, very strange and odd, and without coincidence, I think that everything is trying to be copied, just as maybe many people think that Pyramids and or Babel was a place where possibly there was going to be a portal made to bring back angels to the post-Diluvian epoch to rule over them just as they did in the uh, anti-Diluvian epoch or perhaps even to you know, procreate and create more giants after the flood. And if you take Akkadian as it, take Babel as it comes out of Akkadian and they're understanding of the Babel event. Akkad translates, or Babel translates out of Akkadian as Bab for a gate or gateway and L as in God. So either a stargate or a gateway to the gods or a portal seems to be a connection there that they're trying to recreate with their false uh, uh, mountains. Absolutely. Sorry about that. I have to move this button a little closer over here. All right. And um, so 
from what I understand, is I mean the 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 two hundred fallen angels in the Book of Enoch are totally separate from this Council of the Gods in Psalms eighty two. Or would you guys sorry. would you guys be in agreement with that? I'm sorry, I had a, had a bit of a glitch there. I didn't quite catch what you said. The uh, the two hundred fallen angels in the Book of Enoch and the Council of the Gods in Psalms eighty two are totally different uh, entities, correct? Um, I would say yes, because the uh, angels who who sinned, who kept not their first estate or their place of first authority, um, depending on the translation you read, uh, were punished. They were sent to Tartarus. That's according to Second uh, Peter two four. Um, the gods uh, in, addressed in Psalm eighty two, I believe, are the ones who were placed over the nations after Babel. Deuteronomy thirty two verses eight and nine. Uh, where God divided the nations um, after Babel, basically telling the world, if you won't deal with me, you know, you're trying to establish this false or artificial mount of assembly to force your way back into the divine council. You're not going to deal with me from now on. You'll deal with my subordinates. And uh, those were the 70 sons of God, sons of you know, B'nai Elohim, placed over the nations. Um my belief is that those are the gods being addressed in Psalm 82, where Yahweh says, uh, because you're showing partiality to the wicked, you're going to die like men and fall like any prince. And that was God's way of pulling back and leaving them to their evil, correct? They had been, yeah, uh, the, the hope, I think, was that, uh, and of course, God knew what was going to happen before he did it because he's outside of time. But uh, I think the point was to give them the opportunity to choose to do what was right. Um, and when they chose not to, well, God passed sentence on them in Psalm 82. Uh, and the clue that that is the case is uh, uh, in the, the end, uh, verse 8 and again, going back to the Deuteronomy 32 worldview, where God um, divided the, the the nations according to the number of the sons of God, which is why that number 70 keeps showing up in other ancient cosmologies. It shows up in ancient Egypt. It shows up with the Canaanites who believed that their chief god, El, lived on Mount Hermon with uh, his consort and the 70 sons of El. Um, they were the gods of the nations. Uh, Deuteronomy 4, uh, and I forget the specific verse, but in Deuteronomy 4 it's mentioned that God apportioned the uh, basically uh, uh, allotted the nations to these uh, to these entities, but in uh, Psalm two, the uh, psalmist is calling on God to um, arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. The uh, sentence has been passed. God will inherit all the nations, and the uh, <laughs> those rebellious uh, false gods are. Um, fighting a, uh, I don't guess what they call it, a strategic withdrawal. Basically, they're trying to cause as much damage as they can before sentence is ultimately and finally carried out. So was Bell one of the, the 70, the gods? I would say yes. Okay, that's, that's exactly what I was thinking as well. Well, and Baal in the Mesopotamian traditions is, is a very, very high up. God, and he may even be considered uh, a Satan-like character as well. But I, I generally place him uh, a touch lower. Uh, but it it kind of goes back and forth with some of the occult languages because what he does is he does something similar to what God does. Uh, Baal is is he 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 attacks the. Uh, uh, the Leviathan, and I'm trying to think of whether or not uh, in in that version it's called Tiamat or Lotan or Yam, or there's many different names for yeah. this Leviathan, right? And he breaks the skull in two and divides it into earth and into heaven as part of the, you know, uh, the, the uh, controlling of chaos and creating uh, the, the earth and the sky. And that same type of God is also with the same type of story goes with Marduk and with Ra out of uh, the Egyptian pantheon and uh, China, that would be Pangu and Indra in the Vedas, for example. They all tell that sort of similar story. So yeah. this is a very high up angel if, if you draw that uh, comparative. So, and typically at the top of the pantheon, right under 
uh, you know, the parent god, uh, you have a an Anki or a Baal type character or an Osiris. So that's kind of how I look at them. Yeah, and, and I would agree. Um, you, you also see that in the, the Hurrian culture, which was the uh, north, uh, like toward the Caucasus region. Uh, the, the, their main kingdom during the uh, second millennium BC was Mitanni, around the time of the judges. Um, their their uh, storm god, uh, Teshub, fought uh, a chaos dragon called Ilyanka. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's... And then, of course, in the Greek pantheon, you've got Zeus fighting uh, Typhon, uh, the, chaos, the god of chaos. So it, it re- is repeated over and over again. Um, but uh, certainly Jesus equated Baal with Satan um, when he was accused of casting out demons by the power of Beelzebul, Baal the prince. Uh, Jesus said, you know, if Satan casts out demons by the power of, uh, you know, himself, his, his house cannot stand, essentially linking uh, Satan to um, that figure. And then in the book of Revelation, he equates Satan with um, Zeus when he addresses the letter to Pergamon and says that, uh, I know where you live, in Satan's seat. Uh, the, uh, uh, and of course, that ref- was a reference to uh, the, the altar of Zeus, Zeus being the Greek form of the Semitic storm god Baal, Hadad. So, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say that that is a, a, a pretty positive identification. Yeah, and then when you go to uh, uh, Freemasonry, they generally use the Egyptian pantheon and allegories, and they look at Osiris as, as the male god, equivalent with Baal or Zeus or uh, Tammuz, and there's so many of the similar mm-hmm. type of names. They're all the same god in all the different pantheons, but what they actually say about Osiris, which I think you could take to the rest of these other gods, is, is it was an allegory for uh, Satan, whom they call Lucifer. And so I think you can sort of transpose that through all of the different pantheons around the world, because they're essentially the same religion. The thing I thought was fascinating is in, in looking at the, uh, the crossing of the Red Sea, and realizing that that was a uh, very specific message, and uh, if if not an actual confrontation from Yahweh to this uh, this storm god entity, this uh, Baal or Hadad, who in um, that period of history, this would be the uh, 15th century BC, uh, was equated in the Egyptian pantheon with their chaos god Set, or Seth, who was also the god of the desert and the god of uh, foreigners. Storm God so apparently was syncretized with the uh, with the Semitic storm God. So you had Baal set worshipped as a single entity during the period of the uh, the sojourn in um, in Egypt when the Israelites were there from about 1750 BC or thereabouts until about 1450 when they they left. Um, Northern Egypt was under the control of a Semitic people called the Hyksos. And uh, that was their chief god. But even after the Hyksos got kicked out around 1550 BC, the Egyptian rulers who ruled in the Nile Delta continued to worship this Baal Set character, um, which is kind of odd. You know, Ramses the Great was a was a follower of uh, Baal Set. He erected a, a stele to him called the 400 Year Stele, um, and, and you know it was only later in uh, Egypt's history. Uh, after Egypt had been overrun by Nubians and then Persians and then Assyrians and then Babylonians, that the god of foreigners, Set, was no longer welcome. Uh, and that's when he became the bad guy who chopped up Osiris. Um, so, but, it, you know, it's it's confusing when you start really trying to drill down deeply and identify specific entities with specific uh, characters in these, um, the, the, the cosmologies of the ancient world. Because while Set was equated with uh, Baal, Set was also equated with Typhon, and because Baal was equated with Zeus, and Zeus fought an epic battle with Typhon, then you've got this entity fighting itself, which doesn't make any sense. But the enemy doesn't care what we believe as long as it's not the one thing that's true. So, Yeah, there's always some inconsistencies in uh, the other uh, pantheons and legends and religions that, you know, if you, if you try and go around and, and marry them all up, you'll just go <laughs> yeah, um, that, crazy. That way lies madness. So. Yeah, no kidding. And what's also interesting is is that and uh, Roll and uh, Sitchin and Sitchin's a Freemason, so and uh, ancient alien guy. But mm-hmm. so I want to be a little bit wary of him. But they both uh, wrote that um, 
the followers of Osiris went to Egypt after Babel, and that um, that is rooted in the followers of Asar, which comes out of Mesopotamia, which again links all of these sort of religions back together as being part of the same type of originating religion. And that, you know, this comes out of that whole sun disk symbolism of Ahur Mazda, which was sort of that originating Zoroastrian religion that also moves over to India uh, with the Aryans in about 2300 BC or so to start the, the, the Veda religions, which is, you know, has amazingly similar names for gods. So when we talk about these different pantheons being the same gods with the same just different vernacular names, you know, you, you can pretty much take that to the bank, I think. Yeah. Yeah. David Roll did, did some really good work in bringing back and, and showing some more uh, recent evidence that supported the theories, the early theories of uh, uh, Flinders Petrie, the uh, William Flinders Petrie. I think William is his first name. Anyway, uh, Petrie was was an early Egyptologist who noticed the similarities in the architecture of uh, the earliest uh, Egyptian dynasties, the, the you know zeroth dynasty, the first dynasty, second dynasty, their their uh, architecture and their artwork were very very similar to what was coming out of Mesopotamia at that time. Um, but after World War II, this idea that this invading race from outside established the uh, the dynasties, the first pharaohs instead of native Egyptians, that became very unpopular because it had a you know, kind of a a master race sort of feel to it that was really uncomfortable for uh, historians. So that that kind of got put to the side. But the evidence is what it is, whether you like it or not. So it does appear that the civilization of Sumer is what spread this uh, the, these various religions uh, out from that that central area, and all began at uh, at Eridu, which was the site of the Tower of Babel. Yeah, and and it makes sense because if you have Nimrod staying in Mesopotamia after Babel mm -hmm. and setting up the Mesop Mesopotamian pantheon, and then you have Mizraim and Ham um, leaving, and in Freemason records they'll take uh, Hermes with them over to Egypt to start the Egyptian pantheon, you have uh, the two mainstay pantheons in the early post diluvian epoch uh, being established that are going to spread these religions around the world. And to me, it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing that has been really fascinating about digging into the, uh, the, the, the history uh, is, is seeing you know, how closely the evidence fits the, the biblical narrative. Now, some now scholars, and this is a, an argument David Roll makes. It's an argument that uh, Timothy Mahoney uh, makes in his excellent film *Patterns of Evidence*. That mainstream historians and archaeologists reject the biblical narrative because they're saying, "No, no, we have to look for the evidence of, for example, um, the 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 Hebrews in Egypt only during this very specific window of history, and because they're looking at the wrong time." They're not finding it and saying, okay, well, it must not have happened. Uh, and similarly, when we look back at, uh, say, Nimrod, uh, I place Nimrod during the period that, uh, ar that uh, historians and archaeologists call the Uruk expansion. Uruk was the, the center of Nimrod's kingdom. And this was basically most of the fourth millennium BC, from about 4000 BC down to about 3100 BC. So somewhere in there, probably toward the beginning of that period, was, um, in, in my opinion, Nimrod's. Uh, you know, the period during which Nimrod lived and, and uh, set up the tower or tried to at Babel. Um, but, you know, if you look at the Bible and you try and you take the uh, the chronology literally from, uh, the, you know, the Old Testament, you can't go back quite that far because you don't have enough room then for Noah and the flood and all of the other patriarchs. You know, if you're starting the world at 4004 B.C., you can't put Nimrod at 4000 B.C., obviously. Um, but if we set aside that chronology, because there's some evidence that, uh, you know, maybe not all of the generations were included in, in the Bible. Uh, and there's also evidence if you talk to really cutting edge uh, physicists, and I barely get my head around this, that 
maybe what we perceive as time today is not the same as what they perceived as time then. And that chronological time as we experience it was not equated or synced with solar time. In other words, revolutions around the sun in the same way as it was back then. I, I don't know. Like I said, I barely even understand what I just said. So um, the point is, if we set aside the specific years and say we have to look for Nimrod only within this 200 year window and ignore the fact that there's evidence in the form of uh, surviving poems from ancient Sumer, uh, we, we, we can convince ourselves that things that are documented in the archaeological record really never happened in spite well, of the and, Well, and the other thing is, is that, you know, as, as they document things coming out of secular history, uh, there's a lot of disagreement as to um, how you establish the reigns and then cross them over to the different uh, civilizations because there's not a ton of information to do that sort of, you know, triangulation at times. And, you know, again, uh, I think, you know, cutting edge researchers and writers like, you know, Dave Grohl, you know, suggest that uh, and make a very good case for a different chronology in a lot of cases because they're, they're duplicating many of the dynasties because they had more than one name and more than one title. Right. And, and so the accuracy isn't always there on the secular side. It's just that everybody accepts their theories as fact, as opposed to sometimes theory tales, as opposed, you know, more like a fairy tale at times, but uh -huh. I, might, I might be being a little bit too hard on them, but, and they, and they readily do that to dismiss uh, the uh, biblical chronology and or it's a design thing to discredit biblical chronology because right from the beginning when these mystical religions were set up and were being fed information by these fallen angels who become the gods, they are trying to do a number of things. And what they're trying to do with their science and the history and the seven sacred sciences is A, to lead people away from God and to discredit God for everything and to, to dismiss God and to slander God. So it makes sense that history through seculars is going to be doing those four principles that they've always done from the beginning and also designed to honor the, uh, the pantheon of, of the gods. So again, you know, I, I tend to use a lot of secular dates when I do my research, understanding that they're not always lining up with the biblical date, but that doesn't mean I am 100% convinced that science isn't just projecting another theory or a misdirection. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, one of the things that uh, I have noticed, uh, like I said, working on this film and doing a lot of this research, when I started looking into uh, Nicholas Rorick, him and uh, Helena Blavatsky both, I come to find out the uh, entity that these two were channeling was the same entity, El Mariah. Have you have you guys heard of that? Well, there are key sets of these uh, demons or fallen angels, whomever that they're challenging, and they, there, there doesn't seem to be an endless number of, of these ones. Uh, so it wouldn't surprise me that they're channeling the same names. And certainly Helen uh, Blasky names a couple of her... Uh, spirit guides that she's channeling. Um, and I haven't seen too much repetition of the names, but uh, it would not surprise me that they're, because they're, they're all driving for the same goal, uh, that uh, it would be, would be the same entities that, that they're talking to. But if you talk to whether or not it's the, uh, the, the adepts of Buddhism today and over in Tibet, they're talking to the celestial masters. If you talk to or read about what the Rosicrucians do at their higher levels, they are talking to uh, the Great White Brotherhood and the, and the Celestial Brotherhood that uh, apparently is, is running all the things and still giving them information. It's, it's a constant in all of these religions, whether or not they're the same individuals, one probably presumes they are. Um, but I can't say I have explicit uh, information that says that they're the same two or three or the same half dozen or the same 70, whatever that number is. Yeah, also, the um, when y'all were talking about the Vedas earlier, that was another thing that came up in the research was that, uh, that that was one of the main things that the Nazis were uh, seeking out was the Vedas. 
and they used that to locate uh, the opening down there in Antarctica, the um, New Schwabens land area. And isn't it interesting that uh, that part of the world has become so important to this mythology? Um, I'm, I'm doing some research now on uh, why that is. And, of course, you guys have, have uh, done a lot of research on that for the, the forthcoming film. But uh, uh, you just look at pop culture over the last uh, 50 years and some of the most popular science fiction films have, have featured that idea that something buried in Antarctica hides a secret from beyond the stars. Uh, you know, the, the Thing with uh, Kurt Russell uh, the X-Files movie, you know, Mulder has to go to Antarctica to save Scully from the alien experiment that's taking place down there. Um, uh, the, the Alien versus Predator film, which features a pyramid down there at uh, Antarctica. And it seems like not a week goes by anymore where one of those um, British newspapers that seem to love that clickbait put out another, you know, UFO researcher story who's found something mysterious, you know, poking through the ice and snow in Antarctica. It all goes back to uh, the, the 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 work of, of Blavatsky and and uh, Alistair Crowley, frankly, uh, and uh, ironically, the uh, fiction of H.P. Lovecraft, who professed to be an atheist and and may well have been, but he was certainly channeling information from somewhere. Yeah, and again, these all have sort of the same sort of root source because, again. Derek was talking about, and if I heard you correctly, about Gog and Magog and being up in sort of the northwest Turkey area, which is the Scythian area and a right, special right. mountain that's up there. Well, that's where the Aryans come from. And out of Tartarus, as they say that they escape from and in the mythologies that sort of go along with them. And these are the same ones. And you mentioned the Mitanni dynasty. It's the Aryan Marianu that start the... Uh, uh, Mitanni dynasty, which is one of the powerful dynasties of of, of Nephilim in the uh, post-Diluvian epoch, and they're you know they have gods in there like Indra and Mithra and Varuna right. because it's the Aryans that are going to take that religion to the Vedas in about I think 2300 BC, if my memory serves me right, and they're called the noble ones, the pure ones, the enlightened ones, and uh, uh, they. Uh, would, so when you when you think about all of that, you understand that it makes sense that that information would be starting to come to the West from Eastern mysticism and be made aware and start this mythos again about something in Antarctica. Because again, there's a lot of speculation in the occult circles that Antarctica is actually the uh, continent of Atlantis that somehow during one of the catastrophes, the earth crust slips and it slides down to the bottom of the earth. Whether or not that's true or not, that's just sort of going down a path of some of their their uh, legends. But it goes to that idea that there is something being hidden, something kept secret, something that's going to be revealed at a certain point in time when the people are ready for this knowledge uh, that I think is going to be part of that great deception and delusion of the end time. So you see all of it coming full circle, and it's why it's just sort of swished around and around and around in all the entertainment and all of the ancient sort of uh, classical writings that come down through history that you know, mysteriously are kept alive and are all polytheists and that it matches up again perfectly with what we know about sort of prophecy and what's likely coming to in our direction. Yeah. And Chad, I have to admit when uh, you and Justin and, and Wes contacted us here at Skywatch TV to uh, talk with, with Tom and with, with Steve, Josh Peck, and, and uh, then myself, uh, you know, uh, about the, the hollow earth idea, I thought, well, this is, really fringe. This is, the, <laughs> we're, we're, we're off the edge of the map here. Uh, but when I started thinking about it and realized that this is what motivated the, uh, the Nazis to do what they did. Um, the, the, I believe in a hollow earth was a central tenet of, of their faith. Uh, and then backing up to the Bible and looking at what the Bible has to say about the abyss and the importance of, and this repeated theme that you see, it's not, you know, one of the major themes of the book, but it's there often enough that you get the idea that 
yeah, God included this for a reason here. You know, from Genesis 1 verse 2 to Revelation 21, there are references to the deep, the abyss, the sea, the ocean as a uh, the, the, the place from which chaos emerges. Um, it's not a coincidence that the uh, seven-headed, ten-horned dragon of Revelation comes out of the sea. Uh, it, uh, you know, Revelation 21, after God passes judgment, executes judgment on the, the host of heaven and all the rebellious earth, that the sea is no more. Um, and it, it begins at Genesis 1, verse 2, where the Spirit is hovering over the face of the waters and the deep, the abyss, um, there is something to this this idea that there is something below the surface that is sinister and that opposes the order that God created uh, for us in which to live. Um, but but Gary, you said something I want to back up to because this is really interesting. I was doing a little reading on this the other day. You mentioned the Mariano, which for listeners is the uh, the, the ruling caste of the um, the Aryan. Uh, Hurrian people who founded the kingdom of Mitanni back in the second millennium BC, uh, the Mariano um, kind of spread out through from the kingdom of Mitanni and the Holy Land, uh, Israel or Canaan at the time, but what became Israel was sort of the uh, the buffer zone between Egypt, which was still powerful at that time, and Mitanni. But we find in um, history and also in the Bible, key um, figures whose names have been preserved through the ages who had Hurrian names and may have been members of this ruling class, this, this Mariano class, um, who, who were ruling places in the Holy Land. In fact, one of the two rulers of the area around Mount Hermon that we know from the Egyptian Amarna letters had a, uh, a Hurrian name. Uh, and it's been argued that the, uh, the king of uh, Jerusalem, the, the Jebusite king of Jerusalem at the time that David took that city, had a Hurrian name. So uh, interesting that they were showing up at key points in this spiritual war because, again, of the influence, the importance of Mount Hermon, uh, not only as the site where the watchers descended, but also as um, what the, the ancient Mesopotamians, the, the, during the old Babylonian period, there was a copy of the, uh, the Gilgamesh epic that was recorded on a clay tablet. And uh, it was mentioned in passing in that copy of the, the Gilgamesh epic that uh, Hermon was the secret dwelling of the Anunnaki. Mount Hermon was considered the, uh, the home of the gods or mountain of the gods. In fact, it's even mentioned that way in Psalm 68, although most English Bibles call it, O oh, oh, mountain of God, mountain of Bashan. Uh, but the, uh, the Hebrew, Har Elohim, now Elohim can be singular or plural depending on the context. And because we know that Mount Hermon was not the mountain of God, Mount Zion is the mountain of God. A more accurate translation of that verse in Psalm 68 is, O oh, mountain of the gods, mountain of Bashan. And again, during the Amarna period, which would be the time of the judges, 14th century BC or thereabouts, um, one of the rulers of Bashan, the kingdom of Og, presumably this would be after Joshua and the Hebrews took out Og, uh, was identified as a, uh, uh, not going to pronounce it right, Burad Shawa or something, but it, it, but scholars believe it was in a, a, a uh, Hurrian name. So again, you've got these uh, Aryans who, as you said, Gary, uh, have the worship these these gods who show up later in the Indian pantheon, uh, in the middle of the Holy Land, right at the period of time when God was leading the uh, Hebrews into Canaan and setting them up as the um, inheritors of the land that God set apart for His chosen people. I was also, uh, you know, noting that uh, the the Mitanni are also connected to, uh, in my mind, when you're talking about Hurrian, that they are definitely connected and part of that society. Uh, and there's a few different sort of nations that are set up, but Hurrian and Horite are considered to be probably the same type of people. And yep. These are, again, a mysterious Nephilim people in the land of Seir that's also... Uh, likely is who the descendants of Esau married into because, you know, Seir is is, is a Horite. And these are hairy cave-dwelling giants. Um, mm -hmm. Again, hairy is is, is uh, 
pretty normal for a, a Nephilim description. And so, again, they just reach right down through our history, biblical and otherwise, in ways that people haven't really sort of uh, thought about before. Yeah, and there's another connection. The uh, the Hurrians, and, and I didn't need to do more research on this to be absolutely certain of, of my facts here, but again, just kind of a working theory as I'm piecing things together. This is why I enjoy talking with you, Gary, because this <laughs> thing starts sparking. It's like, oh, wait, and that connects to uh, the uh, the Hurrians spoke what scholars call a hurro Urartrian language, the kingdom of Urartu, which uh, is probably the kingdom of Ararat, uh, the area around modern Armenia where, Mo, or where Noah landed the ark in the mountains of Ararat. Um, that is the same area uh, where Abraham came from. I know most of us have been taught that Abraham came from southeastern Iraq in the city of Ur, but prior to the discovery of that city in the 1920s by the uh, famed explorer Sir Leonard Woolley, most people looking at the the rest of the evidence in the Bible placed Abraham in southern Turkey, northern Syria, around the modern city of uh, San Liurfa in, um, uh, in, in Turkey, southern Turkey. Um, and there was a scholar by the name of... Um, Cyrus Gordon, Cyrus H. Gordon, uh, 1955, 58, 58, wrote a, uh, a paper called um, Abraham and the Merchants of Ura, uh, U-R-A, and placed Abraham pretty definitely in that part of the world as his point of origin. Uh, Ura, not found yet, but close to the city of Haran, where they stopped before they uh, continued on to Canaan. Um, if you actually look at a map and look at the trails, the uh, caravan trails that existed back during the time of Abraham, going from Ur in southeastern Iraq to Canaan by way of Haran in northern Mesopotamia is like going from Nashville to Kansas City by way of Minneapolis. You just wouldn't do it. Um, but there were a people who were related to the later uh, Urartrians or the kingdom of Urartu living in that area and north of there who were called the Chaldees. Uh, these are docu- this documented from other uh, extra biblical sources. So most people thought, well, okay, Southeast Iraq must have meant the Chaldeans. Well, no, there were people called the Chaldees who lived north of uh, the, the in in between, say, the the city of Haran and where you'd find Armenia today. And their chief god was a storm god, in- incidentally, and that storm god's name was Chaldee. So uh, I I think that's where Abraham came from. He came from Ur of the Chaldees, or Ura of the Chaldees. But Cyrus Gordon says, well, when you translated it from the uh, the Hittite to Hebrew, yeah, dropping off that last syllable is something that's documented in other words. So, um, yeah, you had Abraham essentially coming out of an area that was that was dominated by these Aryan people, the the Hurrians uh, or the Chaldees in that specific case. Well, and, that, and it makes it's certainly possible because you know phonetically speaking, vowels were always included in, in in the ancient writings as they come out. They're just kind of been, I think they're more of a, a modern contemporary sort of addition. That's why you basically have a lot of languages that are written in the old ways that are basically just consonants. So, right, right. So when you're trying to recreate. Of those words coming out of prehistory, it's easy to have a vowel added or one deleted. And then when somebody else comes along and reads that, then they take that in a different direction, which is one of mm-hmm. the difficulties of doing really good research on prehistory. But um, but the more you dig into it, you can connect dots like what you're doing, Derek. It starts to make a whole bunch more sense that that's likely where Abraham came from. Yeah. And according to Gordon, uh based on some texts that have been deciphered from around the you know, 16th century BC, the, during the time of the kingdom of uh, Ugarit, that uh, this city of Ura was known as a place where a lot of traveling merchants originated. Well, you know, basically that's what Abraham was. You, you go from place to place, you sell, you, you trade livestock and, you know, and whatever. Um, so yeah, it, it kind of, it, it fits better than, uh, trying to picture Abraham as a city dweller, which is what the Sumerians were down in Southeast Iraq. They were city dwellers who looked at people like Abraham as uncouth, uncivilized savages, ate raw meat. They were, you know, smelled bad and, uh, <laughs> just, they didn't want them around. Abraham fits the milieu, the culture of, um, Northern Syria, Southern Turkey in the 20th century BC where, when he originated there. 
And, and again, just to draw another connection, another important people group, uh, more important than what we've been taught through the, the, the biblical narrative, and I think for their influence um, both on history and on the spiritual history of the world are the Amorites. And the Amorites pretty much dominated all of the, all of the Fertile Crescent, including by the time of the sojourn in Egypt, um, they ruled northern Egypt as well as the Hyksos. The Amorites were in control of basically everything from Babylon to uh, northern Syria, or there was a kingdom there based at Aleppo, uh, and then down through what is today Lebanon and Israel, all under the control of Amorites. But um, the book I'm working on for next spring will dig deeper into their pantheon, their cosmology, and uh, why I believe it uh, has reached its fullest fruition in uh, modern Islam. Now, the, the Amorites, the uh, last descendants that we know of on record of them was the Phoenicians, correct? Yeah, the Amorites were essentially the ancestors of what we call the Canaanites, the uh, Phoenicians, um, yeah, were, were essentially the uh, people who, who succeeded or, or uh, you know, followed the Canaanites on the coast. Uh, you could also, are, it's scholars believe that the Arameans were also the descendants of the Amorites. Um, where the Chaldeans come from, the ones who set up the later Babylonian empire of um, Nebuchadnezzar, they may have been a tribe of Arameans, so descended from the Amorites. That's my thought right now, but I've not found scholars in any agreement on that. But uh, yeah, the Amorites were essentially the um, the progenitors of the later Arameans, Canaanites, and Phoenicians. Interesting. Have you guys, uh, have, are you, either of you guys familiar with uh, Darren Kuyi up in Turkey? Nope. No. It's uh, basically, it's a gigantic underground city um, that they recently, I think they rediscovered it back in the 1960s, or it could have been back in the 1930s, I'm not exactly sure, but it's basically a seven-level underground city that 5,000 people could live underground quite comfortably, and it's right there in the Turkey area, uh, Cappadocia. Okay, that's not Global Tacky you're talking about, is it? No, 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 no. No, okay. Go- 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 Tep- uh, that, the one you're talking about was the one that they just recently discovered that uh, was completely buried. And they yeah. said that that city was deliberately buried. Yeah. Hmm. But, I well, mean... I- well, and, and uh, you know, seemingly Petra, what we see of Petra is just the superficial top level. And it's got a, you know, the major part of Petra is actually underground as well, so... You know, I'm not sure where you're going with it, Chad, but you know, there's there's certainly a lot of uh, archaeology that's I think that's not all that well known that suggests that there was some you know significant underground cities that were built. Hmm. And again, what what I find significant about that, if you take you know the Horites who are you know uh, associated with the Hurrians, and you take that back to Korai, they're actually cave dwellers, right? And is that what they're talking about? Is is that um, Nephilim were builders of great underground cities. I'm just speculating and connecting some dots, but it's just interesting. No, no, you're you're right. You're dead on. And that's the thing is that uh, you know what was it? National Geographic just recently recently put out an article within the last week that said that 80 percent of Petra is still underground. It has name, you know, and that, that's one of the things I love about Timothy Alberino and and Steve Quell. A lot of their research is that they that's one of the things that they talk about quite extensively is that a lot of these places that you go to, whether it's down in Peru or Middle East or, you know, even here in America, it's like, yeah, they, these places are amazing. But that's the thing is you're only seeing like the very top five, ten percent. And hmm. when you get down underneath the ground, and that's the thing, another interesting point that they both brought up is that they believe that a lot of these antediluvian sites, you know, these uh, megalithic sites they believe that they are actually built on top of pre adamic sites. And, you know, y'all were talking about the chronology and everything being off. I mean, that, that was one of the things that uh, Blavatsky talked quite a bit about uh, was the, the root races. You know, you were talking about the Aryans. Well, the very first root race that she talks about is like these spiritual beings. That, that's what she referred to them as was spiritual beings. 
And, I mean, if you get into, like, the pre-edemic gap theory and all that, I mean, that right there, that answers a lot of questions that people have. Yeah, it's fascinating stuff. I don't think we'll know the, the answers to all of this stuff until uh, we have the opportunity to ask the Lord directly <laughs> after it comes back. But there are things that we, we discover that make more sense if you allow for the possibility of the, the supernatural realm, things for which the, uh, the natural sciences can't always explain. I mean, sometimes th- these, these explanations uh, you know, with the ancient aliens guys will say, well, you know, we can't move a block this size today with the equipment we have. So I'm not saying it's aliens, but it must be aliens. Uh, well, yeah, except that in the 18th century, Catherine the Great moved a stone bigger than any of the the stones in the Trilithon at Baalbek without even using animal power. And this is the uh, Thunderstone for the base of uh, the statue of Peter, De Gra- Peter the Great uh, was moved uh, a, a quite a distance. Um, and again, it was all human power. But, you know, they were able to do it by freezing the ground and using, you know, ball bearings essentially underneath the, the stone to move it. Uh, so... Yeah, it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a supernatural explanation. But when you're dealing with things like, you know, head shaping or uh, the similarities between r- r- religious practices or, you know, well, the, the similarities between pyramids found all over the planet, um, you have to then begin to wonder whether there isn't an outside influence affecting the decision of primitive man to do these things, you know, and and again, using this the, the dating system, the chronology of secular scholars, who wakes up in 7,000 BC and decides, you know, hey, let's let's wrap Junior's head so tightly that it makes it pointy. Or, you know, we we could invent writing today. No, no, let's let's see if we can perfect the technique of, you know, wrapping Junior's head into a point. Uh, because apparently, what I this was something I hadn't expected to find. Just looking at the history of the uh, the prehistoric world, the uh, pre-flood world, really, uh, is that. In the ancient Near East, what we consider today Syria, Iraq, Kuwait, Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, it was universally practiced. Everybody apparently had a pointy head. At Eridu, where they found the uh, earliest level of, of the temple, uh, as they ex- excavated that site back in 4849, the, uh, the team uh, led by the uh, Iraqi Ministry of Antiquities found 206 sets of human remains, and all 206 had deformed skulls. And they all date back, they said, to about 5400 B.C., somewhere in that range. So again, why were they all doing it? Exactly, now, yeah, they were, they were trying to emulate something that they had seen, and that was the thing is... You would uh, think so. At least, that's a, that, at least that's a possibility. I mean, because this happened for such a long period of time, and they found deformed skulls with human remains all over the ancient Levant, uh, all over the ancient world from uh, northwestern Iran to southern Turkey to ancient Jericho, uh, all over. And it was, like I said, it wasn't limited to one class within the society. They couldn't even identify uh, the the, the structures within society going that far back anyway. But it wasn't like only a few people uh, who were obviously set apart. It was like everybody. And it it was like everybody for like 6,000 years. And that's the thing is that, you know, some of these elongated skulls that are out there, I mean, that, that's the thing is if you look at them and compare them to normal skulls, the, the suture is not even there. I mean, it doesn't yeah. have the suture, plus not to mention the brain capacity. If you were, uh, I think. Well, they, now, they, I, I, now, I don't know that, that that is exact. I don't know that that's true for these skulls that have been found in the ancient Near East. Yeah, frankly, there's two you know, kinds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it, yeah. Frankly, in, in a lot of cases, it's because these were found so long, so far back that they don't exist anymore. They can't get to them anymore, and the scholars who found them weren't looking for that or didn't want to go there, and so just you know mentioned, oh well, this was probably due to earth pressure after burial. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. right. Yeah. It sounds like so. it's almost connected to their their search for the wisdom and for the power well, that they thought things. that it would gain. There's a couple things going on. I mean, first of all, just so that people understand out there, there's obviously ones where people have bound heads to emulate something, and I would suggest emulate their demigods, which would have been the uh, the giants and the Nephilim, because uh, they were a serpentine-looking um, figure that had these elongated skulls. But the thing is, is with the human ones, is what you can't do with that by binding is create a bigger cranial capacity. Right. So you True. have the second kind that... Um, 
that Chad is talking about, uh, and a lot of them don't have the normal human suture, and that's probably, uh, and most people conclude, are from the giants. And then the second thing is, is that there is in the occult side is, is that they were doing this this pressure on the brain to manipulate the brain to increase their mental faculties, whether that's true or not, or actually at work. So you have this idea of, of emulating their demigods and uh, probably their gods, because the gods had that serpentine look in a lot of cases as mm. well, uh, as well as you know perhaps trying to distinct themselves or distinguish themselves as a priest class or a noble class above the regular mundane. So I think all of this is is all going on, but it goes to the root of these polytheist uh, societies that have these demigods that aren't fully human, and you've got these gods that go back to seraphim angels. Yeah, and I would agree with that. And again, all I'm saying, without you know trying to make any specific uh, or, or definite uh, 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 you know statements about what these uh, these ancient skulls, and again, we're talking you know pre flood 4000 BC and before, you know, earlier, um, because we just don't know for sure. We don't have the evidence at hand. Uh, and many of the scholars who were looking at this, look at looking at human remains from that period of history, uh, either don't want to go there because it's considered too fringe to, uh, safely protect your PhD or your status or your, uh, <laughs> your tenure yeah. with the university or whatever. But, uh, the scholars who have written about it over the last, uh, a couple of decades have said, you know, there really isn't much research on this, and here's what we can find. But, you know, that's because like, well, they don't yeah. get funded afterwards. <laughs> it, exactly. Talk yeah. about it. And, right. And, and they actually have a word for these types of discoveries, like, and they call it oparts. It's right. uh, out, out of place artifacts. And then they just get shoved aside because nobody wants to deal with them because it doesn't fit the manipulated, sort of contrived. Uh, history that that they're that they're very very slow to change the, the accepted history right yeah that or anything that points back to the bible that's one of the things yeah. that they will definitely yeah. bury right. and <clears throat> in fact i really enjoyed the uh, recent thing where um what was it uh tom horn had uncovered the uh, the thing about the smithsonian that they uh, the uh, their their founder you, you want to talk about that real quick Derek? well uh yeah, to be honest with you, I've been uh, kind of tied up in my own research here, so I'm not intimately familiar with that. But I know that they have found some things regarding the uh, remains, human remains that were dug up by, uh, you know, uh, white farmers as as whites began settling the, uh, you know, the United States as we after the post-colonial period in the the 19th century, as whites moved westward gradually uh, and began turning over the soil, they were turning up sets of remains that were larger than average, and many of those were scooped up and taken off to Washington, D.C. to the um, Smithsonian. Um, but as far as the specifics, to be honest, I haven't had time to read Tom's articles. I've got them flagged to read because it's going to be a fascinating <laughs> read, but uh, no, you'd have to ask Tom about that. Yeah, he uh, basically they had uncovered that uh, the everything that they were saying about their founder was completely false. And uh, I think oh, I, I tagged. I tagged. Well, let me let me tell you a little bit about him then. Uh, I don't and I don't know what Tom wrote, but uh, uh, Smithson was one of the youngest uh, members to join the Royal Society. He was educated at Oxford, and so right out of uh, university, he becomes part of the Royal Society. He's also a Freemason. And so when he leaves this money, uh, it's going to be uh, taken over to be brought over uh, by, you know, a couple of American presidents who are both Freemasons. And so this whole thing is answerable and funded back to the Royal Society. So if people think that this is an organization that is um, embedded in a vacuum of secular uh, objectivity, it's rooted in mysticism because the Royal Society is set up by Freemasons and Rosicrucians to do those four principles that I was talking about earlier, is, is to lead people you know, away from God and to discredit God for everything and to slander God and to on, honor the pantheon of gods. So why anybody would think that the Smithsonian would give us an objective perspective and coincidentally lose 
somehow every upart and anything that suggests otherwise that ever goes back to them you know is just not a surprise yeah especially like i said all the skeletons and all that i mean they found a 18 foot skeleton here in seymour texas which is right down close to san antonio and then we got the rock wall over here in rockwall texas which is literally 10 minutes down the road from me that, you know, basically they were pulling out artifacts. You know, they were trying to say, well, this is, you know, who was it? Uh, Scott Wolf or whatever on America Unearthed, the History Channel, was trying to say that this was all a uh, naturally occurring geological thing. Well, first of all, this guy's not even a <laughs> geologist, okay? If you really want to get me started, the guy's not even a geologist. He says he has an honorary degree from some college. Well, they gone and looked into that that college has never ever given out any kind of honorary degrees period and so i mean his his whole argument is all nonsense and you know not only were they pulling out artifacts they pulled out a skull to an 18 foot giant out of there as well in fact part of the wall used to be um completely unearthed well well they eventually filled that in with what they got they call lake ray hubbard now part of the wall is actually under the lake that was the only way they could hide it was to, to fill it in with a lake. Hmm. And yep. not and only it, that, but 150 miles away from here, there's another place called Milano, Texas, where there's another wall that they said is even bigger than the Great Wall of China, and it's buried underneath, under, under the ground. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it should also be noted that uh, people should have a look at the Smithsonian logo. It's that creepy sun-worshipping logo. And it's a very similar logo to that of the Jesuits. Again, mm. no coincidences there. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you were not going to get any real truth out of, out of that organization, but maybe I'm being a little tough on them. No, I think you're. I think you're being dead on right there. Because, like I said, that's yeah. that's. Well, I mean, long before the Smithsonian came along, we know that the Vatican was going all over the place, and that they were carrying a lot of this stuff off. I know that uh, what was it, True Legends, Volume One. Uh, one of the things that Timothy unveiled when he went down to South America, down in Peru, was he actually found documents from the Spanish Catholic when they first came over. And it talked about that they found caves with these elongated giant skeletons that were almost 27 feet tall Mm. that were literally sitting on thrones and adorned with all sorts of jewelry and that they were worshipping them. They had been committing sacrifices in these caves for hundreds and hundreds of years. And, of course, you know, that's the thing is they carted those skeletons off that we'll never see those ever again. Right. And and again, it's this cave thing and this subterranean thing that sort of keeps sort of resurging all of the time. And, and I know you'll appreciate this, Chad. I mean, just think of the Temple of Pan um, over in the Bashan area, you know, where Jesus went to uh, preach and announced uh, Peter to be the rock of, of the church. I mean, that was over a cave that was thought to lead to the underworld, right? And, and, and was known as the rock of the gods. I mean, this whole idea of underworld and gods is another one of these consistencies that just don't seem to go away. And it doesn't matter seemingly where you go around uh, the world, you know, like you have the, you know, the Nagas that were, again, the serpentine type race um, that, you um, were considered the uh, the the gods and symbolized the netherworld and the underworld, and again you have, now you have this this serpentine imagery coming back, and you have these naga priests which are very similar to the you know Sabeti or the Sheptiu and the Nakals and all the different seven sages, the rishis out of Veda out of India, uh, all telling a very similar story, but also. Um, doing these unusual cities and things that have subterranean aspects to them or that go deep into mountains. It's very, very strange and, and interesting. And if you leave it just as coincidence and, and don't make the connections, I think we lose the story. And I think we need to, you know, we need to dig further into as to why they were building these types of uh, facilities. Yeah, and the uh, the Nagas. I mean, that's 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 some amazing stuff when you start getting into all that. Uh, I know that you've recently been doing a lot of uh, research into the dragons over there in India and China. You want to talk a little mm-hmm. bit about that, Gary? 
Sure, we can. And as as we talked about, is is that it's the Aryans that are going to carry this belief system and and this religion into India, and they're going to found. Uh, uh, you know, Jainism and Hinduism, which becomes Buddhism, and then the Chinese uh, religion goes back to the Indian religion and is actually centered on that. And this whole idea of the dragons go back to, and the dragon creators go back to the belief system of the Nagas and that um, pantheon that they believe in. And just as that's the same pantheon that is uh, exported down the road over to Japan and floods all of Southeast Asia. And that's why you have this consistency of these dragons and these consistency of the Nagas. And knuckles were the same thing over in the Kishamayas as they're recorded over there. So, and these Nagas were, and there's two sets of Nagas, just as there's two sets of uh, uh, of the uh, Sabeti or the uh, uh, Apical, oh, I can't get that word out right now. We were talking about it earlier in, in the show. Apkalu, yeah, they're the same same types of beings where you have seven major angels, as mm-hmm. similar to what Enoch will talk about the book of, that is giving all of this information to civilize the civilizations around the world, uh, whether it's writing and uh, and other knowledge, uh, agricultural stuff, all the stuff that you need to build a civilization. And uh, they also create a priesthood, and a priesthood of Nagas in some parts of India, or the Brahmins, as the name comes out of the Aryans, or and they're all going to have the same name. So whether or not you're talking about the followers of Horus, or the companions of Horus, or the Nakals, or the Nagas, or the Tengu. These are all the same type of snake brotherhoods, and there's two classes. There is a god class, like a god like the Thoth, god, wisdom god of Egypt, which is part of that companions of Horus uh, um, uh, organization of religion and developing a, of the knowledge. And you have... The, the male one, or the, the, the priests that follow after, and they all have a tradition of these rishis and nagas somehow surviving, and generally there's seven of them that survive the flood narrative in, in these occult and polytheist religions uh, to carry this antediluvian knowledge forward to civilize the earth afterwards. Just an amazing amount of... Uh, commonality in these Nagas as as being uh, the god ones as opposed to the demigods, priests, or just human priests, um, they were considered wise beings from heaven. Okay, They were also considered to be shapeshifters, and they can also take human form. Um, they... Uh, they were lords of the underworld, uh, again, as, as what I, I mentioned earlier. And a naga, uh, best represented and transliterated down, is the cobra. And so you have nag- naga going back to a specific type of snake as opposed to sarpa, which would be snakes in general. So the nagas were this cobra-type look. And again, we have this cobra-type look in the Egyptian pantheon. And the pharaohs, the, the headdress that they would wear would represent sort of those wings, uh, that not wings, but that, that dressing around a cor- cobra's head. Mm-hmm. And... Again, uh, I just don't find that this is coincidental because when we get over to, let's say, the Kishimaya and Central American um, and North American cultures, we have these gods that are the feathered and the plumed serpents, and we have the Thunderbird gods. And so what we have is a sort of this serpent imagery of these gods with wings uh, and with feathers, and I think they're talking about all of the same. But what's really kind of unique, as with the Anunnaki, um, is is that there's also these bird-like beings, which are more akin to the uh, to the uh, Tengu out of Japan and out of China. So there seems to be a couple variations, or they just have this changeling sort of capability. But again, it all goes back to the same seraphim type of uh, powerful 
gods that were around in the Antediluvian epoch. And they all spawned both the priest class, as in the Brahmins in, in, in India, um, and or in Taoism as it comes out of the Chinese, and a military and noble class of rulers. Again, this is very common. And if you look at any of the infrastructure around the world of the dynasties they have, the god that they worship up top, the pantheon of gods, they have their representative, the divine representative, pharaoh or king or emperor, and then they have this organizational structure of mysticism, that's the religion, and the developing of magic in the cult and the sciences. And that goes all the way back into prehistory. And if you understand that when we're talking about prehistory and they're talking about wizards as being the priest class, you understand where that allegory fits in on some of the fairy tales and the entertainment where it comes down. Just as the magi, where magic comes from, are an extension of the priest class and the name that they accept for what they're developing in terms of the sciences with Nimrod after Babel. That was a rant. Sorry. No, no, absolutely. (laughs) Fascinating stuff. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I, I just realized I, I was going on for a very long period of time and, and maybe I should let some people in here and <laughs> you can keep going that's it's fascinating was there was there any areas in there that you wanted me to cover off a, a little bit more in in detail or oh I mean you, you, you go wherever you want to go with this I mean that's the thing is that you I know you've done a lot of research into the whole thing about the dragons and the the um, the connections there between all the different dots and stuff. Yeah, because again, the the you know if you get into the creation gods of most of these of these, uh, well, let's just say all of them for for sake of e- uh, of, of simplicity, is is that these are serpent gods and or dragon gods that are. Uh, involved in polytheist creationism. And in there you have the various Leviathans and um, Rahabs and and Yams and Tiamats of the world. Uh, You know, they're all talking about the same uh, type of God. Just as, you know, you get into, um, you know, the Asgard and Norse mythology. I mean, again, they have the same type of Leviathan and they call it... uh, uh, Mitz Gardamar, and that's where uh, when that animal is destroyed and uh, is separated, as in all of the stories that we talked about earlier, that's where Middle Earth comes from. So when I talk about that, the these fairy tales are telling this history of polytheism. You just have to understand the language that that they're talking about. And what's also interesting as we go a little bit deeper in it is is that uh, as you get into Let's say uh, Cambodia is, is it, and again they have the same uh, understanding of the of the Nagas, and they look at them as uh, reptilian beings um, who at one time possessed an empire in the Pacific Ocean, ruled over by King Kaluuya, but at some point in time they were that was destroyed and they, they uh, settled in India where the Cambodians eventually get their, their religion from. And again, that goes back to that antediluvian sort of epoch and the flood and the cataclysmic changes and how many different types of civilizations were there? Was there one or was there as many as nine is what occultism will talk about. And so the seven-headed Nagas that are depicted at Angkor Wat represent in their belief system, seven different races of these Nagas. So seven different kinds of them. So they're suggesting there are some different kinds of these Nagas, whatever that means. Uh, I have not discovered what that means, but it's, you just can't seem to go anywhere in the world and not see this seraphim serpentine angel with wings Imagery, that's part of the gods, just as you have the gods being depicted as serpents in Mesopotamia and in a lot of cases, even the ones on um, Mount Olympus are just, are, were originally depicted as serpents. And that makes sense, too, because Enki is considered the wisdom god and the serpent god, right? 
You know, fascinating stuff. The the thing that uh, is, is really intriguing is when you look at some of the old iconography of the uh, Sumerian god Ninurta, who was the uh, the warrior god, son of Enlil, who was uh, kind of filled the same role in that pantheon as Baal or Hadad later in the Canaanite pantheon. You know, the uh, the the older god, the elder god, who was the king of the gods or the creator god, and then the younger, more energetic warlike god who came in and, and took over as sort of the vice regent, if you will, um, Ninurta fighting a seven-headed dragon on a Sumerian uh, inscription from the, uh, I think, about 2300, 2400 BC. So um, when you compare that with the prophecy of the seven-headed beast coming out of the sea, the abyss, in the book of Revelation, uh, you've got connections there that, again, are just beyond uh, coincidental. Uh, yeah. I, I hate to hate to uh, break early from a party, but I'm getting some emails here. There are some things that I have to attend to at work here pretty quickly, so I'm going to need to jump off the call. Uh, I, I apologize for having to do that, but there are some things that need to be attended to rather urgently here on the side that uh, came up unexpectedly here. Well, it's no problem, Derek. We appreciate you taking the time to come on with us. Always fascinating, and you're always welcome to come back. Well, I appreciate that. And I'm sorry to cut early because I'm enjoying this conversation immensely. <laughs> it's always fun. And Chad and uh, Kay, uh, just uh, thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. Sorry to have to cut out early. But like I said, some things have popped up here while we've been talking that I need to need to get on pretty quick. All right. Well, we appreciate you coming on, Derek. You have a great day, sir. Yes. God well, bless good to, you. Yeah. Good to talk to you, Derek. Always fun when you're on. We just start banging off different things that we need to dig into deeper all the time. It's amazing. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to getting past a couple of projects here where my schedule frees up a bit. Have you back on uh, View from the Bunker. Oh, that would be awesome. All right. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. We'll talk again soon. All right. Sounds care. good. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. I, I want to take a moment to say something. I know that I'm being rather quiet during this interview and this is a learning experience for me because there are so many things that are being said that that are totally new and I'm soaking all of it in and I'm hoping that the audience that's listening is coming to this interview um approaching it pretty much the same way I am. I wish I was asking more questions but as I'm coming up with them, you're answering them, Gary, and Derek was also. So um, I don't want my quietness to be taken as rudeness. It's just I am very, very engrossed in what is being said. Well, and that's the whole idea is, is to get the information out. And it's so wonderful to have a person like Derek on the show who is, you know, very, very familiar with uh, Mesopotamian history and other history to be able to build on these things and put it together with more details that sort of makes sense for the people because a lot of times at the shows you get sort of you get a superficial aspect but not enough information to properly connect those dots and mm -hmm. I'm always a fan of trying to give a little bit more information so that people know that we're just not winging this and we're just not making it up as we go. That's one thing that um, I really enjoy about doing deception detection radio is that we our goal is not to do the surface, but to actually get into the core, the meat of what it's all about. And we're always assured of that with you and with Eric also. So I just wanted you to know I wasn't trying to be rude. I am just totally enthralled in the conversation. And Chad, as always, you're asking and making just the right questions and statements. Well, that's, so, that's one of the things that we like to do on here is we like to give our guests the opportunity to say what they need to say. And we don't want to sit here and ask questions unless the, a particular question comes up that needs to be asked. We want to give you the chance and opportunity to, to say exactly what you come on here to say. Yeah. Well, and I appreciate that. And, you know, as, as we we're just talking about some of the Chinese and the Indian, and let's include the Japanese. So you have the, you know, a Lee family that's out of the, uh, the, the China bloodlines, and you have the Yamamoto bloodline coming out of Japan. And uh, I'm, I'm still trying to wade through all of the, the different doorways through the basic bloodlines in India. But it's important to understand this, uh, how it happened in prehistory, because it all has a rele relevance for prophecy. So that when we talk about uh, 
the the metallic empire that Daniel is talking about uh, in the end time that you know the descendants of these empires are going to not only mix with the offspring of, of humans so it's going to be iron and clay with clay being I think representing the humans and the metals representing the dynasties but there's also kings from around the world like we have a 10 nation empire and they're referred to as the kings of the east in the revelation and i think we need to understand that there's not just western families and bloodlines that are going to make up these kings this is going to be a worldwide empire represented by all of these ancient uh, bloodlines that are still existing and perhaps some uh, human bloodlines as well Yes, and also you have the, uh, like I said, with a lot of the research that we've been doing on the film, I know you've heard of a book called The Coming Race. I know you probably mm-hmm. read that. Okay, well, you know exactly where I'm going with this, is that that will all tie in with Revelations in times. And that uh, the whole thing about Abaddon, the bottomless pit, and basically the the whole thing about the coming race and the whole, I guess, the Theosophical beliefs and stuff uh, like Blavatsky and Crowley and all them was that they believe that there is a race inside the earth that is going to come back onto the earth and that they have a master and that's how they mm-hmm. refer to him. They refer to him as the master that he will come back and that he will rule over the earth. Yes. Yeah. And they're wanting to have that new Atlantis, that kingdom that was reigning in the antediluvian epoch. That's why Francis Bacon, uh, in his book, uh, The New Atlantis, called it the New Atlantis for the end time. And it'll have the mystical religions with the ruling uh, bloodlines of the Nephilim or a new Nephilim, because they're always trying to create new Nephilim and the old gods. And then coming out of the... uh, the abyss are the fallen angels and these scorpion-like little beasts, right? And what's interesting about those scorpion beasts, again, if you understand what's going on in prehistory, uh, you have some documentation, and particularly in um, a, a couple of old uh, uh, Mesopotamian documents uh, about these uh, scorpion gods. And one is the uh, Enuma Elish as one example, and uh, the other one was, uh, I think it's uh, out of the uh, it's, it's Dubar uh, tablets um, that uh, Smith had discovered. And what it's talking about is, is the scorpion beasts, and you know, they were locusts, and they had the body of a scorpion. I'll give a description. They looked like horses prepared for battle, um, just as it's talking about uh, in, in Revelation. And so they had, uh, they're known as a crab buamalu or gerta bilu, uh, two different names, different languages, basically what's coming out of, and uh, also part of the uh, Epic of Gilgamesh as well. And uh, they had large, large, uh, they're very large beings with uh, the head and the torso and the arms of a man, but the body of a scorpion with avian or bird legs and wings, and they launched powerful destructive weaponry as some sort of arrow from bows and they also had a had a stinger in their tail that it was a venomous stinger that they could sting people with and it is amazing that is an absolute description of uh, the scorpion things that come out with the the fallen angels and what they were was they were actually sort of like a military and a guard associate with the, the with the gods as they as they were described in these these ancient epics and what's also interesting is is that if you take the word scorpion uh, back to Hebrew as it comes up a few times in the Old Testament, it's actually spelled A Q R A B number you know six one three seven as what a scorpion is. So again, you get this correlation that is coming together about what the end time is going to look like. And all of this stuff that seems so fantastic out of prehistory is going to burst onto the world stage in a very quick manner and in a way that is going to overwhelm people and deceive them in a way that they could not have imagined and thus they're going to buy the lie. They're going to believe the lie. 
Yeah, and that's the thing is you you get a lot of Christians that they they that's the biggest thing that they always ask is why do we need to know this? What's what's the importance? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, uh, I know you like to talk about CERN, and I don't know whether we've talked, you know, about where CERN comes from. Um, But, you know, if you do some research into polytheism, you understand there's two gods that are specifically named CERN. One is Cernonos, which is a druid god, and its counterpart, which is the same god, which is CERN out of the Etruscan pantheon. And this is, uh, uh, this is a god that is described exactly the same way as the Pan god is. And they name this thing after these two gods, after the Pan god. And the, as, you, as, you, as we've talked about, I'm sure you've talked about many times, is people think that the CERN is trying to find a way to get into the abyss to release Azaziel, who the Pan god is associated with. Yeah, and uh, it's, plus, I mean, it's all it's all hidden in plain sight. Well, not only that, but look at where CERN is located at. What's smack dab right in the middle of the the circle? That's where the uh, Temple of Apollo was, and that's yeah. where they believe that the, the abyss is located directly underneath that. So that's the thing is, it's it's all done for a reason. It's not just happenstance or just luck or whatever you want to call it. They put that there for a very specific purpose and you know it's there in a specific place for a specific reason yeah and uh, again when we talk about apollyon uh, apollo uh is and there's not very much writing on this but i mean most think of think of uh, apollo as uh, as, as a sun god uh, but he's also you know a god of of the underworld as well and um you know there's uh there's a temple that's actually dedicated to uh, Apollyon, uh, which was his other name, and uh, you know he was known there as the you know the Greek god of death and pestilence, as well as the sun god. Yeah. So I mean, it, it it all it all ties in. It's all that's the thing is when you have the the right pieces to put together, it makes a much clearer image, and you can actually see that this is all interconnected. And that's the thing is we don't we don't talk about this stuff for people to be fearful or anything like that. We we like to discuss this because we want people to be prepared, not just, you know, in a physical sense, but mentally as well. That's the thing is that if you are mentally prepared for what is coming in the tribulation and all that, then you will be able to deal with it when it arrives. You know, Gary, that you were just, you and Chad were just speaking about knowing what happened in the past to be prepared for the future. Well, we're told in the Bible that there's nothing new under the sun. So everything that has happened will happen. So it's very important that we, we take heed of everything. I mean, it wasn't just put in the Bible to be taking up space. It has a definite I, meaning. I agree. And uh, you, then you put that alongside with what Jesus said about uh, signs for the end times, that it's going to be like the days of Noah, and mm-hmm. nothing new is under the sun, then it's more than just people were getting buried and before, they, before the end came. It's the whole ideology of what happened before the, the flood and what's been going on over and over and over. Babel was just... You know, another rebellion, uh, just as the end time is going to be the final rebellion. This has happened over and over and over throughout our history. It's really fascinating when you take a look at it like that, and you know that you're, what you're reading is going to come around again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, and if we do, if we are prepared, we can alert other people. And even if and even if they're not ready to accept it, the seed's been planted. And then they'll have to make a choice uh, at that time, but uh, at least they'll have a chance to make the right decision. Exactly. And I mean, I've I've even had, I mean, I, I'm it, it breaks my heart to say this, but I've even had a family member tell me that if the end times came, that they would take the mark of the beast and let their daughter take the mark of the beast because they wouldn't want anything to happen to them. And yeah. I, it, that literally shattered my heart when I heard that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I think uh, you know, a lot of people will make those types of decisions, and 
also in the face of do you want to have certain death, persecution, and or torture and imprisonment, uh, or do you want to take the mark and, and survive and be promised godhood? I mean, that's the stark reality that people are going to have to make. The problem is, is what's good on the short term is not good on the long term. And if you take that mark, um, you know, there's 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 no reprieve. Uh, it clearly says in the Bible that if you accept that mark, you're going to burn in the lake of fire forever and ever. Yeah, I'd rather take uh, God's way and suffer for a short while instead of for eternity. At least, you know, yeah. I figure if someone wants to send me home early, hey, go for it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, the uh, at least you'll, you know... <laughs> At least you'll have, you know, the first death and either be uh, um, raised into heaven uh, or you'll have a second death and you won't burn forever. I mean, I, the first two choices are better, but one would be, you know, saying, let's just let's think about this and let's let's go with the one who's going to uh, promote us to immortality forever and, and choose God. Amen. But it's going to be a difficult choice because it's not going to seem quite that simple in the heat of battle and that's why if you always know what you're going to do when before you get into those situations the decision becomes much easier than trying to make a panic-stricken hurried decision because uh, this will happen very quickly as it all comes to pass and we have to prepare ourselves for that if you go into a situation where you're being persecuted and you know what the enemy is going to do or you don't know what the enemy is going to do, but you have an idea. You can't make an intelligent, rational decision. But if you run every scenario through your head and it's almost like, training and you help God ask God to help you with that then he's going to give you the strength to get through that but if you just go into it and you really you're not aware you're in major trouble yeah and if this is the generation and I think we're you know I think we're in the zone of all of this starting to to unfold then we don't have the easy path, uh, so we'll have a more difficult path, but one one presumes uh, with what we're going to do, greater rewards will will come come of it. But again, I think that's why you know we're told not to you know uh, want to look forward to the end times because it's going to be a very terrible short period of time. But then after that, obviously it leads into um, you know, eternity, you know, starting with the thousand year millennium and then off into eternity. Do you find, Gary, that right now you feel um, a heavy heart and that there is um, so much sadness because you know that we've only got a limited time to reach people? And that's what God has us doing is out there getting his word out and trying to help them to hear God's calling. But I, I feel like that we're running so short on time that we're not going to be able to reach everyone. And that really weighs heavy on me. It, it, it does. And it's, you know, it's, we can only do what we can do and, and do it to the best of our ability. But I believe that Again, because I like to go back to what Jesus said, and I have a different take on things at times uh, than other people, particularly on prophecy. Uh, I believe that the 144,000 are going to be the ones that are going to preach the Bible to the people in the end time that Jesus talks about the gospel being preached around the world. And it's only for a short period of time, but I think that's part of... Uh, trying to get the message out for the people of the end time. So nobody can say that they weren't properly warned in the end time um, because it is going to happen very quickly with a whole bunch of different things that are just going to overwhelm people. So, What do you see right now, Gary, that stands out the most to you that is a direct, that you can actually have that direct link between now 
and what is said in the Bible in Revelation? Is there one key thing that stands out to you? In terms of what's coming together that suggests that we're going to be in the end time? Yes. Um, like there's the yeah. wars and rumors of wars. I mean, we're seeing that now. But there's a lot. Is there anything in particular yeah. that stands out? Yeah, I would suggest two things. Um, and it may be... The second thing is actually, you know, two things or three things. So the first thing is, is that um, I, I do believe that we're in the fig, fig tree generation. And so then it gets to be how long is a generation and what is actually what triggers the fig tree generation? Was it Israel becoming a nation in 1947 or was it uh, taking of Jerusalem in 1967? And is a generation 70 years or slightly longer or estimated around that? Either way. If we're in the fig tree generation, that is the big event. And so things will come when they come. And the second thing would be is, is as I watch, you know, and it doesn't matter who's in power, is we have this continual march towards global government and uh, being afraid of wiping ourselves from the face of the earth. And there's more and more talk that comes along with that, with uh, religions talking more and trying to find ways to bridge that. So I would say those are the things that have me um, really uh, thinking that we are where we are uh, as that couples up with the technology uh, that we have in place, which would have to be a great technology based on what that, I think they had in the antediluvian epoch. So those are the, the major sort of things that I see that are happening. And even though it seems to be taking a long time to put together. Uh, we have to understand that until the restrainer is removed, like the end time can't happen. So everything is preparation and then things will happen very, very quickly. And I think they'll happen very, very quickly after we hit that trigger with the aid of catastrophes. So does that answer the question that you're talking about? Or were you looking for something more specific that I could point towards? No, you answered it. That was good answers and uh, right on. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, you're, also, you're welcome. And also, the, uh, the when we were talking about CERN a while ago, I know, and uh, I think it's Ecclesiastes where it says that uh, don't go poking your holes into hedges or you may be bitten by a serpent. I kind of see that uh, one of my friends, BDK, recently, uh, one of his podcasts, he had talked about that. He actually interpreted it more as don't go poking your uh, finger into other dimensions or you may be bitten by a serpent. Well, <laughs> probably either or, no doubt about that, I think. Yeah. So, um, well, and, and this, again, it's that whole ideology of, uh, of serpents that is very, very important. And one of the things that I always appreciate is is how the Bible doesn't work with uh, in, in coincidence and how it links things that people don't tend to look for. So, you know, in Luke 10, you know, it talks that uh, Jesus is talking and he's talking about seeing Satan as he fell from heaven, which is obviously referring to Isaiah 12 about uh, Lucifer as it comes out in the King James Bible. But what he also says um, is, is uh, I also give you, you know, power to dread on, tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, right? And he's talking about these imageries that we've been talking about the whole show. As he talked about beholding Satan falling from heaven. That is not a coincidence. No. Not at all. Chad, did you have any more questions for Gary? Oh, we could do this all night, but I know Gary's, I know. <laughs> Gary's got things to do. He, he's, <laughs> he's a busy man, and uh, man, I love your book. Your book, Genesis 6 Conspiracy. Oh, my goodness. I got to say, if you do not own this book, you need to run out and buy it right now. That's right. It's great. I recommend it to everyone. It's so good. And I still have it as my Bible companion. And you well, I appreciate I that. You said, time. <laughs> you said that you're uh, you're working on a second book, correct? I am. I need to find more time to work on it, though, because it's not coming along very fast right now. About halfway through, I guess. But I know It's not going to be 20 or 30 years? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I'd like to put out a few more. <laughs> so that I got to shorten that time frame down a little bit. <laughs> well, you can tell that you put a lot of time and love into the Genesis 6 conspiracy. Is there anything, Gary, that you wanted to share with everyone tonight that we haven't um, touched on or brought up? Um, no, I think, you know, we've given people a lot of information. Uh, and again, kind of the point is, is that if you don't understand prehistory and if you don't understand that the giants were real, as it's talked about in Genesis 6 and as they come up after the flood again, you lose a significant ability to interpret and understand what the Bible is talking about all the way through and also what's going to happen in the end time. It is the one of those sort of decoding uh, secrets that you need to have. It's the right lens to view Israelite history, our history, the history of the world, and what's going to happen in the end time. And without that, you're you're kind of half blind, and you will be surprised. So um, learn about this um, and dig deeper into it. That would be my encouragement for people because it, it really is the you know to you know to continue to mix metaphors, the Rosetta Stone to the Bible. Yeah, he's not joking about that because it talks about in Isaiah in the Septuagint version, it says that uh, giants are uh, what is it? Giants are coming to fulfill my wrath. Yes, yes, uh, uh, and again, I, I don't look at that as, uh, and again, not all translations have it quite that way um but they it might say mighty ones or it might say other sort of versions but they are talking about the same type of entities or at least the bloodlines and who knows maybe uh full full grown giants we don't know yeah and then you got matthew talking about you know was it uh says men's hearts failing them for fear for looking at those things coming upon the earth yeah so i mean that's the thing is these things are coming back they, they were real and they are going to come back on the earth again. I agree. Well, Gary, you have been on Deception Detection. You're still the reigning returning guest that we've had on more than anyone else. And I know that Chad and I are already looking forward to the next time. But could, for those who haven't heard where they can contact you order your book could you please share that with them sure um the first place to either contact me or order my book you can go to the genesis 6 conspiracy.com genesis 6 with the number six you can get a hold of me through there i have a generous excerpt of every chapter on that website uh to give you a good feel for the book uh, you can also follow me on gary wayne um, uh, on Facebook and two Genesis six conspiracy pages. There's been, uh, somebody has set up a Gary Wayne, uh, group, uh, Genesis six conspiracy, and I'll be posting and commenting in there regularly. And you can also follow me on Twitter at Gary Wayne six, three at Gary Wayne six, three. And if you get a hold of me with a question or a comment, you want to come back on, I will get back to you on that it may take me a day or two, but I will get back to you on that. And as far as ordering the book, uh, you can order signed copies from me off my website it's also available through uh, barnesandnoble.com and amazon.com and amazon.ca and around the world. And you can connect to those off my website or go directly to them. It's also available in Kindle form, which you can uh, also co uh, connect to off my website. It's also available on all uh, online retailers. And it is available through pretty much any retailer, even if they don't have it on the shelf and you want to support your local bookstore or local Christian bookstore. Uh, it's distributed through Bookmasters, so if you tell them Genesis 6 Conspiracy by Gary Wayne through Bookmasters, they can bring it in for you. And if you don't own it, everyone, it is an investment that will change your life. It will change the way that you look at everything around you and how you view the Bible. So Chad and I highly recommend it. Chad, you said that you would like to say tonight's closing prayer. Could you go ahead and do that for us, please? Sure. Father, we thank you for this time to come together and to uh, talk about your word and learn and sharpen on one another. Um, I hope that everybody has found this edifying as well as informative. And we ask that you bless the entire audience out there as well as Gary and Derek and Kay and 
Justin and BDK and all everybody else. Um, we appreciate all that you do for all of us. And we thank you for opening our eyes as well as our hearts. And if anybody has not accepted Jesus as their Savior, we ask that uh, they come to know him and that they turn their lives over to Jesus and that they make the ultimate decision to serve and follow you. And uh, we pray all these things in Jesus' holy and mighty name. Amen. 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 Again, Gary, thank you very much. Thank you, Chad and Derek. It's going to do it for tonight, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. We pray you have a blessed week. Good night, everyone. To the night, I raise my hand to the fire, but it's no use, cause you can't stop it from shining through, it's true.